Hello, everyone, on today's colloquium. I have pleasure to introduce uh, the Michele Grasso, who is the PhD student of mine. Uh, he's a member of, of my group since 2017, and he has been working on the on light propagation in cosmology, uh, especially on numerical applications and numerical solutions. Uh, and his seminar today will be a, a report of his of his progress over the last four years. So, Michele, uh, the fl the floor is yours. Okay. So, thank you, uh, thank you for the introduction and. Uh, also for give me the opportunity to talk about uh, my PhD work, which is a uh, uh, focus on life propagation in cosmological simulations. Okay, so let's start by introdu uh, introducing the, um, the, the standard cosmological model uh, in cosmology, uh, which is the uh, lambda called the dark, the dark matter or lambda CDM model. Uh, which uh, has gained it, uh, a lot of popularity uh, thanks to its ability in explaining the observed uh, the, the observation the cosmological observ observations so um uh, very briefly so the lambda cdm model uh, rests on three main pillars first it is based on general relativity uh, with the assumption of large scale homogeneity and isotropy it is mainly dark in the sense that uh, the 95% of, of its constituents are dark matter and dark energy. And also the structure formation are modeled by uh, perturbation with perturbation theory at early times on large scales and using Newtonian dynamics uh, at late times on small scales where uh, the nonlinearities uh, became important. Um, the um, key parameters of the lambda of the lambda CDM model have been tested uh, by uh, multiple uh, techniques and uh, with better than a few um, with a precision uh, better than few uh, percent. Sorry. Um, however, with the improvement in cosmological observations, some tensions uh, have appeared. And um, especially between measurements done at uh, low and high redshift. Um, so um, two different paths have been uh, taken in order to overcome these tensions. On one end, we try to have a better uh, model of, of uh, cosmic structures formation. And on the other hand, we try to have better experiments. All this led to a tre tremendous uh, progress in uh, cosmology, marking the beginning of the so-called precision era. This term precision has a double meaning. On one side, it refers to the fact that uh, 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 the current and upcoming uh, uh, cosmological surveys will probe the, uh, the, the large scale structure of the universe with the um, ever greater precision of 1%. But also, on the other hand, it refers to the, uh, to the precision that the, um, um, of, that the theoretical models have to aim in order to be able to explain uh, the observations. However, having a, a, um, a good model for the, um, the cosmic structure formation is not the end of the story. In fact, uh, we have to know how the cosmic structure affects light propagation and how we can model uh, general relativistic effects in the observables on, large, on uh, cosmological scales. To do so, we should take into account all possible effects act, uh, acting on the light during its travel toward us. But as you can imagine, this is very difficult. So what we usually do is to make some assumption to uh, simplify our description of the of the phenomena, so this is the idealized um, version of the problem of the real problem that we want to describe, which can be summarized as follows: We have an observer O, which sees a faraway bright source E for a, a prolonged period of time, like uh, he continues to see the, the the source E for years. 
Um, since uh, uh, in cosmology, the observer and the emitter are very far away, one assumption that is usually made is the geometric optics approximation, meaning that the photon's wavelength is much smaller than any characteristic lens of the, pro of the, of the system. Uh, within this assumption, we, uh, we can uh, consider that the photons fall uh, curves, which are called gamma, uh, which are called uh, uh, null geodesics. And here I denote the, the, this null geodesic connecting the emitter the observer as gamma. Um, in our description, we want to be as much general as we can, so we will allow the observer and the emitter to move freely along their trajectories, with the only constraints that they uh, the size of the uh, the typical size of the region in which the motion takes place is much smaller than the distance between the emitter and the observer. Okay, so within this assumption, uh, we can identify the um, the null geodesic connecting uh, O and D by giving the position and the tangent vector at the observer, and these two quantities are connected with the position, the tangent vector at the emitter via the null geodesic itself. As I said, we allow the observer the emitter to move freely. So after some time, they will be in a different position. And uh, so they will be connected by a different null geodesic. Again, we can give, um, uh, we can uh, identify this, uh, this uh, new geodesic by giving the new position and the new tangent vector or we can describe, uh, we can give the deviation in position and the deviation in the tangent vector uh, to describe how this new geodesic differ from the first one. And in general, we can use these two quantities to parameterize all the later uh, time uh, null geodesics. So in this article here, we show how deviations uh, around the observer are uh, connected with the deviations around the emitter by four operators, which essentially map the deviations around two points of the spacetime. These uh, are called bilocal geodesic operators of, or BGO, and they uh, encode all possible effects uh, coming from the interaction between light and spacetime curvature. Uh, the evolution of these operators along the, uh, the null geodesic gamma can be obtained by solving this uh, ODE, where this term here is just the curvature, represent the curvature along the null geodesic. Okay, so different combinations of BGO can be, um, can be considered to uh, take into account different uh, optical uh, effects. For instance, uh, WXL has information about the lensing effects, meaning the uh, distortion of images due to the fact that the light is propagating, uh, is propagating in a curved spacetime. Or um, we have that WXX has information about the parallax effects, meaning uh, uh, representing the apparent motion of a source with respect to its background, when we displace the uh, observer. And many other effects can be uh, described by taking combinations of the BGO. The BGO uh, for, uh, formalism um, is an alternative to the standard uh, formulation of light propagation, uh, which is uh, called uh, Sachs, uh, which is the Sachs approach. Uh, so the Sachs formalism was formulated in 1961 and uh, essentially it describes image distortion uh, by uh, calculating the, this, the, the formation of uh, uh, a 2D cross-section of the light beam. So for, for this characteristic, uh, the Sachs approach is very well efficient to describe lens effect, lensing effects, but it accounts only for those uh, um, distortion along a, a 2D screen while in general, we have deformation in all four dimensions. On the other hand, with our BGO, we can uh, describe all possible distortion uh, um, of, of the light beam uh, in, uh, in both uh, um, uh, temporal and spatial uh, directions. And for this reason, the BGO provides a straightforward way to describe what happened when uh, the observations are, occur for a prolonged period of time. 
So in addition to the standard lensing effects, they can also describe the drift effects, uh, which are the temporal variation of optical um, observables, and also the parallax effects and many others. So in this sense, the BGO approach constitutes a unified framework to study light propagation uh, in, in general uh, relativity. Um, the application of the BGO of formalism in the context of numerical um, or cosmological uh, simulations is the main goal of my uh, PhD uh, project. Um, it, let, let's say that um, cosmological simulations and in general uh, numerical, what is called numerical relativity has become a powerful tool in uh, theoretical cosmology and uh, astrophysics, uh, which has collected uh, many important results, like for instance, in studying uh, compact objects, uh, in, uh, in uh, describing uh, the gravitational me, waves. Can I ask the question? Yes, sure. Before I get completely confused. I mean, these W operators, are they not uh, random quantities? What do you mean, random? Uh, yeah, well, because the lensing, I mean, it's uh, these objects which influence applied propagations are not, uh, we don't know how they are distributed in the universe between the observer and the source. Yes. Shouldn't we do some statistical analysis of what happens? Okay. I have a so... light source which sends the light to me through the universe, which is full of all sorts of things which can affect that light. And I would presume that this, this distortion of the, of the light beams uh, are statistical. Okay, so let me uh, clarify this point. First of all, uh, as I said, this BGO structure, but also the, the Sachs uh, formalism uh, has some assumption. One of these assumptions is that, uh, okay, I said um, uh, geometric, uh, geometric optics. And this means that um, we uh, have only, let's say, smooth uh, variation or smooth cur curvature. We don't consider uh, the case like um, having uh, some very concentrated source of, of, of um, uh, space time distortion. Yeah, so, but, but, but are you making an assumption? I mean, I mean, on the physical grounds. Okay, on the physical I mean, grounds, the, what the, we have the distortions of the. I mean, they. We don't yeah, know yeah. How, where where they are and how big they are and so forth. So, shouldn't we consider that to be a statistical property? Let me finish. So, on the on on one end. We, within this appro approximation, the two the, the geodesics which I mentioned stay close, right? And this W essentially gives the, uh, let's say how uh, this, uh, again, this the deviation here and in tangent vector are mapped here. What you are referring in the real world, what we do, we have to, um, perform many of these, uh, of, of such measurements, let's say, and then apply statistical uh, uh, analysis. Excuse me, if I may interrupt. In fact, there was a French guy named Fleury who wrote his PhD thesis roughly about what, what you were proposing. He, he treated the equation for part of this W as a stochastic differential equation and tried to go this route, but this is not what we did. We we work on exact certain known exact solutions. Yeah, so but, 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 but I that. I mean the reason why I ask this question is that uh, that seems to be to me quite similar to the the following, and no, I mean not cosmological experiment. I have a cloud of objects, which somehow affect the light which is propagating through the system, the light begin, being deflected, absorbed, and so forth by those objects. And I have an observer sits on the other end. And uh, the conventional uh, 
I mean, it seems to me that what you are doing, you are writing in the much more general way, a complicated diffusion equation, which describes what happens to the energy sent by in the form of, a, of the electromagnetic waves from a, some distant dis observer to, to us. And uh, whatever we measure will depends on whether we understand what are the properties of those scatterers in the between. And uh, uh, the common mistake done in the hundreds or so publications is that in the normal physics that you would have said that this energy is, is flow of the energy from the source to the observer is described by the conventional diffusion equation. And that is not correct. And there has been a very famous paper written by Nico van Kampen years ago, where he solved a, a simple model, which is when the light, what happens to the lights affected by the Kirchhoff laws on those scatterers. And it turns out that this is not the diffusion. So the statistical properties of what is in between the source or an observer may be completely distorted. And I, I don't know whether you can learn any, anything about it by just looking at what happens to the observation. But you know, this is the only thing that we can do. So we can just observe the universe from our small point in the, in the cosmos, right? We, we cannot do, how to say, uh, uh, statistical so analysis no displacing in another points of the cosmos, right? So you don't, you, 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 you don't have any additional information which would allow you to, to, to model those statistical Yes, problems. yes, yes. Statistical, statistical inference in cosmology is a real problem in the sense that we have just one, uh, one observation point. So th there are different kind of, uh, let's say, uh, statistical uh, consideration that one has to, to do and some kind of averaging doesn't match with other. And this kind of averaging doesn't compute. So it's a very complicated. I, I'm not an expert in, in this All right. uh, field. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, I just was curious why. why no, no, that... but one, your, your point is, is, is important. In fact, so, as a, as a, as so Nico, I said. Gravitational wave spectroscopy help to learn something about the statistical property, at least for the lensing. Are Sorry these again? images fluctuating in time? Do they do the image is changing with time? Uh, yes. Um, for instance, I will show you later uh, some something more, uh, let's say, uh, physical relevant, which is the. Let me clarify what I mean physical relevant in a second. But is the redshift drift, which is the uh, temporal variation of the redshift. So we observe a redshift uh, of a source in the source, and we see that this redshift changes in time. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, uh, when is I said uh, it's re physically relevant in the sense that this, in principle, can be measured, but is a very small effect. Mm -hmm. um, so physical relevant in the sense that can be measured but it's very small, so we don't know if we are able to measure it. Mm -hmm. And we need years to have a, a, a strong signal that can be revealed in the uh, real uh, experiments. Yes. But you know, uh, we were able to detect the gravitational waves for so probably in 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, I was saying that um, we have uh, the, 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 the context of uh, numerical uh, relativity. And uh, um, let me say that it is well known how to trace uh, uh, geodesics in, uh, in a numerical relativistic simulation. But what is missing is a complete, uh, um, um, a full treatment to study life propagation in uh, numerical relativity. And in this context, uh, the BGO provides uh, the, the, the best machinery to use uh, to fill this gap. Okay, 
So a common feature between uh, uh, the codes used in numerical relativity is the three plus one splitting of the space-time, also known as the ADM formalism. So let me explain what is this. Um, um, as you all probably know, in uh, uh, general relativity, all quantities are written in uh, covariant form, meaning where space and time are mixed uh, together. Uh, however, if we want to apply uh, uh, numerical methods uh, in the simulations, we have to uh, separate, to split the uh, spatial dependence from the temporal dependence in order to recast the equations as a Cauchy problem. So the three plus one splitting uh, does exactly this. It is a way to map for dimensional spacetime into 3D uh, uh, hypersurfaces, one for each instant of time. This structure is called foliation, and uh, ideally is like doing uh, time lapse photos of the of the space time. Sorry, can can you see my pointer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's like doing a, a time lapse photos of the of the space time. Uh, in three plus one, uh, the space time uh, geometry is then described by these uh, four quantities, which are. Gamma j is the metric on the hypersurface. Kappa j is the uh, curve, extrinsic curvature, which, which expresses the bending of the, of the hypersurfaces due to the fact that they are embedded in a higher dimensional space. And then we have the lapse alpha and the shift beta, which are the normal and the tangent part of, of the time flow through the foliation. So, as we uh, as we want to uh, as I want to apply the BGO framework in the context of, of numerical relativity, writing a code which uses the BGO uh, in three plus one seems uh, a, a, an obvious choice. So what I did was to obtain a recipe to uh, to compute the BGO in three plus one in order to calculate uh, cosmological observables from simulations. So let's see how this recipe looks like. As all recipe, we, we start with some ingredients. And the first ingredient of our recipe is the space-time metric that can be inserted into the ge uh, geodesic equation to obtain the geodesic connecting the source and the observer. Uh, as I said, it is well known how to trace uh, geodesic in numerical relativity. Um, and the first application was done in 1994 uh, to, uh, uh, to find the event horizon of a black hole. But for my, uh, for my purposes, I decided to follow a more recent formulation. Uh, and these are the three plus one equation of the uh, geodesic equation as written, uh, as presented in this article here. Now, since we want to compare quantities which are defined to different points of the spacetime, we need to parent transport RS, a reference frame. To do so, we have up to apply the, uh, to the vectors of the frame the parent transport equation. And this is the form of the parent transport equation in 3 plus 1, uh, which I, uh, I have ob obtained. Uh, another ingredient that we need is the curvature along uh, the null geodesic. And this is the expression of the, of the curvature uh, in terms of its uh, three plus one uh, quantities. These other two ingredients can be inserted into the ODE for the BGO. What solution gives uh, the BGO along the, uh, the, the line of sight? Now that we have the BGO, we can mix them with the observer and the meter for velocities and acceleration to compute uh, cosmological observables. And here I'm listing a few of them, which are the angular diameter distance in terms of BGO, the parallax distance, and the uh, um, redshift drift, which, as I said, is uh, express the, uh, the, the temporal uh, variation of, uh, this, of the redshift of a source as seen by the observer. All this recipe uh, is encoded in a big light, which is a mathematical package I've developed uh, to uh, compute uh, um, the BGO in uh, numerical simulations. The package is already publicly available on GitHub with many examples. 
And essentially it works as a, an external library that can be loaded into a mathematical notebook uh, to use the functions which are defined uh, in it. The user just need to provide uh, the metric and the uh, emitter and the observer uh, as an input. This can be done as, uh, in two different ways. Taking the three plus one quantities from a numerical simulation or giving the four dimensional, uh, the, 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 the components of a four dimensional metric uh, in the analytic uh, form. Uh, some of the reason why uh, I use the uh, Mathematica is that uh, we can use the manual tested numerical method, uh, which are uh, implemented uh, already in, in the work from language, but also we can use the precision uh, control option uh, which uh, uh, essentially allow us to set up the precision of our numerical calculation. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I will show you some tests and application of, uh, of, the, of Big O Light. <coughs> Let's start with the test. And uh, the tests are performed by calculating um, optical observables <coughs> in different, uh, uh, in well-known cosmological models. Um, and then we compare our results with the one obtained using the standard uh, method. So the first test regards the calculation of the angular diameter distance and the ray shift in the lambda CDM model. In this model, we have an uh, analytic expression for those observables. So we will calculate uh, the variation between the numerical observables obtained with big light and the analytic expression. Uh, here, we'll show you two different uh, uh, cases. On the left, the case when we provide to the package analytic input for the metric. On the right, the case when we take the three plus one quantities from a numerical simulations. So let's start with the redshift. Uh, and as you can see, in, for both type, uh, we have a good agreement between the analytical and the numerical uh, calculations with some difference uh, depending on the type of input that we gave. In fact, on the left, for the um, analytic components of the metric, we reached the 10 to the minus 31 as a, a variation, while for the, sim the input from a simulation, we reached 10 to the minus 10. These two number can, uh, numbers can be considered as the, uh, uh, the uh, numerical error, uh, our numerical error in estimating the observables. And what we see on the right is just the simulation error, which also affects our calculations. The same um, results is found for the angular diameter distance. And again, we see this 10 to the minus 10, which is this, the, the error that, we, that came from the uh, simulation of the space time. The second code test was uh, uh, was done by calculating the same observables, but this time using a different model of the universe, which is the Sekers model. Uh, the Sekers model uh, represents an exact solution of the Einstein equation, but uh, where the, um, contrary to the lambda CDM case, uh, uh, we have uh, an inhomogeneous distribution of, of the matter. And these uh, uh, inhomogeneities are set by these two functions here. Uh, for this test, we calculate the, the observables numerically, but using two different uh, methods. On one end, we have uh, the BGO uh, calculated with big O light. And the, on the other hand, we have the SACS approach uh, and the observables obta are obtained solving the SACS equations. Mm -hmm. Uh, here I'm showing the variation uh, for the angular diameter distance and uh, for the redshift. Uh, and as you can see, um, this number says uh, said that we have an, a good agreement between the observables calculated within the BGO and the one within the SACS formalism, stating the fact that the BGO are completely equivalent to the SACS formalism when we want to calculate such a classical observables. One of the advantage of the BGO is that they um, provide a unified framework to calculate multiple, uh, uh, the many observables within the same formalism. 
And here I will show you how it is uh, possible to calculate the redshift drift uh, with the BGO. So when we use the BGO, we have an, uh, um, an analytic uh, uh, general formula to calculate the redshift drift, uh, where uh, and the BGO are here, contain, are here contained in this capital U matrix, where, um, uh, which is a block matrix where the blocks are combinations of uh, the BGOs. I said that this formula is general in the sense that it is valid for any uh, uh, space time that we want to analyze. On the other hand, when we use the standard approach, uh, we don't have a, a general formula like, uh, like this, and we have to uh, calculate the redshift drift for the specific uh, um, uh, for the specific uh, space time that we want to analyze. And here I'm showing the expression for the redshift drift, uh, the the ODE that we have to solve to obtain the redshift drift in the Sagerish model. And this is instead the, the analytic expression that is easily obtained in the Lambda CDM case. Uh, so on the left, I'm showing the variation uh, between the um, redshift drift calculated with, uh, with the, the BGO and the one calculated with the, with the uh, standard procedure for the redshift, while on the right we have the same but for the lambda CDM. And as you can see, uh, we have a good agreement between the, the redshift drift calculated in these two methods, saying again that the BGO and the BGOLite is able to reproduce uh, well-known uh, known, uh, results um, with a high uh, precision. Okay, so as an application for a big o light package, in this article that we recently submit, we uh, um, investigate different uh, sources of nonlinear GR effects on optical observables as they are triggered by cosmic structures. So as I said in the beginning, it is important to understand what is the impact of inhomogeneities on light propagation and uh, um, uh, this fact was uh, uh, heavily studied in the past uh, by many authors to, um, uh, to motivate the observed accelerated expansion of the universe and also to calculate possible bias on cosmological parameters. Uh, the state of the art is that uh, uh, the effects of inhomogeneities on light propagation are too weak to explain uh, the, uh, the uh, observed accelerated expansion of the universe without using dark energy. And also that the effects of inhomogeneities on cosmological parameters are much smaller than uh, the experimental precision so that they can be treated uh, within linear perturbation theory. Uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we don't expect to find uh, uh, different results with our big light package, but still, together with presenting uh, the code, we were able to identify nonlinear this light propagation coming from different contributions. So how we can... Uh, um, what uh, do you mean by nonlinearities? Maxwell equations are linear and all that is linear. What does nonlinear mean? So uh, Einstein equation is, um, in the general form is nonlinear in the... Yes, in the... but light is here. Yes, of but course, light then interacts light with propagation. The... Why the light propagation is linear, unless you have Kerr effect or something like that. So yes, but light propagation is affected by the nonlinearities of the of the let's say space time, of the cosmic structure, and this creates GR effects on the observables. I, uh, but I understand that you take some given metric and then the fact that Einstein equations are nonlinear has no effect. Um, in a sense, but if you take let, let let me say this. So if we take the uh, the uh, the Maxwell equation and we uh, compute in in minimal coupling in the the, the equation in uh, in a curved spacetime, then we have an additional term, which is the the, the Riemann tensor, right? 
Of course, but Riemann tensor is the space structure and like propagates on. And the Riemann tensor is nonlinear in the in the metric. But not the light propagation is not affected by the nonlinearities of the gravitational field. The equations that describe light propagation are linear. Well, if you consider light propagation in curved spacetime, you have this rich in term. And rich is not linear in the metric. In the metric, but not in the characteristics of the light signal. Excuse me. Uh, if you go to the geometrical optics approximation, um, you find out that basically light moves along null geodesics. And the yes. equation for null geodesics is in general nonlinear. And its perturbations uh, at first order are linear, but then you can look at the resolvent and it solves a nonlinear equation, actually. So that's what but we I mean. don't understand because I thought that geometrical optics is an approximation to Maxwell equations. Mm -hmm. And Maxwell equations are linear. Yes, but when you when you look at the ray equation, it's not nonlinear anymore. Sorry, sorry. Uh, probably I'm I, I, I I'm not understanding the question. So when you have uh, the, 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 let's say, Maxwell equation in curved space, then you have the, um, the, the, the Laplacian of the, of the, of uh, the, the potential plus the Riemann times the potential, right? Sure, but Maxwell and the Riemann, the Riemann, uh, the think, Riemann uh, gives the nonlinearity. There, there is a linguistic confusion in this discussion. Probably. The electromagnetic field appears as a linear object in this equation. The, the fact that the that the coefficients in the equations are nonlinear function of something is irrelevant to this discussion. Exactly. I mean, that's the point. I have another question. I mean, the, yes. there is there is a, there is a beautiful picture on your slide which I am now seeing. Is this accidentally the, that at a certain face uh, of your pulsation, this picture looks like the Bundlebrot apple? This here. Yes. Well, this. I I I'm using this picture, <laughs> so to uh, to introduce the standard perturbation, meaning... Um, oh, okay, so this is not the results of the calculation. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, I was puzzled how come that all of a sudden the, the, this complex uh, behavior of a... No, no, this, this is of just a... a of a cubic is, equation on the complex plane shows up in your... No, 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 this is just all a right. hay, hay catching uh, picture uh, just to, uh, you know, you, you focus really, your attention. You really truly confused me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, so, um, okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's say this, um, how the uh, nonlinearities, uh, uh, how we can, um, uh, sorry, let me, so how we can uh, isolate nonlinearities, nonlinear effects. Um, I already mentioned that in uh, um, we we can have different kind of uh, uh, of uh, approximations schemes in uh, uh, general relativity, and I already mentioned two of them. I mentioned the standard perturbation theory, which uh, uh, consider the um, the inhomogeneities as small fluctuations over uh, a homogeneous lambda CDM background. But also I mentioned the post-Newtonian approximation, which essentially is an expansion over relativistic effects, meaning that uh, uh, solutions are found by adding uh, uh, levels of GR corrections to Newtonian gravity. The point is that uh, the post-Newtonian approximation can dig deeply, respect to the, the perturbation theory, can dig deeply into the nonlinear structure formation. So our idea was to uh, take a toy model of the universe, which has, uh, in which the uh, cosmic structure have a nonlinear dynamics. 
uh, use the big light to calculate observables at linear Newtonian and post-Newtonian approximation, and then compare those observables to see what is the um, uh, what are the uh, the impact of nonlinearities. So. Um, as a toy model uh, of the universe, we consider the so-called plane parallel uh, metric, uh, the plane parallel model, or wall universe. Essentially, this is a model of the universe con uh, in which uh, which contain a, um, a dark uh, energy, which is modeled by a cosmological constant lambda, and where the dark the dark matter is uh, uniformly distributed along parallel planes, which are orthogonal to a given axis, as shown in this picture here. The free function of, of the model is uh, the gravitational potential. And for this analysis, we set a simple sinusoidal profile with K, the scale of, uh, uh, gives the scale of the oscillations and A gives the amplitude of the potential. So um, we use the form of the plane parallel metric as uh, presented in this article by Villa, Matares and Maino in 2011 in which uh, the metric uh, components are already, gi already given in post-Newtonian expansion and uh, also written in uh, terms, of, uh, explicitly in terms of uh, uh, cosmological parameters. So given this form, this metric is ready to be used as analytic input to our uh, big, uh, to the big light package. Um, as I said, the, the core of the study is to compare observables calculated in different, uh, at different approximations. And in particular, we calculated the angular emitter distance and the redshift in the following three ways. Taking the Newtonian uh, part of the plane parallel metric and computing observables exactly uh, with the big light package. The second case is when we take the post-Newtonian plane parallel metric and we calculate the observables exactly again with the big light package. And the third case is when we expand at linear perturbation theory, the metric, and then we calculate observables up to linear order. Uh, then these three uh, calculations are repeated varying the scale of the inhomogeneities and the amplitude. The comparison between the observables uh, is done uh, by calculating uh, the uh, variation, which is defined as a fractional difference of observables. So our results answers the following four questions. What is the contribution of nonlinear light propagation? What is the impact of uh, inhomogeneity scale? How much the free parameter of the model affects our comparison? And how important are nonlinear post-Newtonian corrections? In a certain sense, we already have an answer to the first question from uh, other uh, results in the literature. But with the, uh, these other three questions, we dig more deeply in the sources of nonlinear uh, of nonlinearities. And in this presentation, I will just show uh, the um, the results for the angular emitter distance only for for a matter of uh, of time. Okay, so the first question is, uh, what is the contribution of nonlinear light propagation? To answer this question, we calculate uh, the variation linear Newtonian, post-Newtonian, Newtonian. And this is what is shown in this picture. And as you can see, the variation between linear and, uh, and Newtonian uh, angular emitter distance is much smaller than 1%. Uh, however, we also see that the variation linear Newtonian is similar to the variation post-Newtonian Newtonian. And this is quite strange because we would expect that the variation linear Newtonian has, uh, uh, is bigger than the variation post-Newtonian Newtonian. So we were able to, uh, so this means that the linear and post-Newtonian angular diameter distance gives the same kind of uh, uh, corrections over the Newtonian angular diameter distance. I will discuss um, more deeply um, why this is uh, why this is so in the last point. 
Okay, the second uh, question is what is the impact of inomogeneity in this case? Uh, so here I'm, I, I'm showing the variation post-Newtonian and Newtonian uh, calculated at different uh, scale k. Let me point out that we see such a high regular oscillation because we consider, uh, we consider a simple sinusoidal profile for the plane distributions. But what matters here is the amplitude of the oscillations. And as you can see from the picture and also from the animation, uh, the amplitude decreases monotonically as the scale k becomes smaller. Um, in a certain sense, this match our int intuition since uh, uh, when we take smaller scales, uh, we have uh, a more condensed uh, distribution of the planes and ideally, when k tend to zero, uh, we are not able to distinguish between uh, two planes, uh, two consecutive planes, and essentially we recreate a homogeneous distribution of, of, uh, of matter. In that case, we lose the source of the difference between linear post-Newtonian and Newtonian, and everything reduced to the lambda CDM uh, case. Okay, so the first point was uh, uh, to see what, uh, what is the impact of the free parameters of, of our model uh, in our, uh, of our model. Um, in fact, you need to know that in our in the post-Newtonian uh, metric, uh, we have a parameter which is uh, marked as A and L, and it express. Uh, the, uh, the um, deviation from a Gaussian distribution of the initial uh, perturbations. And for this reason, it is all usually known as a primordial non-Gaussianity par parameter. Um, since uh, uh, this uh, parameter acts as a, as a trigger for certain post-Newtonian terms in our metric, and also since it has a lot of room to vary inside its uh, confidence interval uh, as it measured by the Planck satellite, we decided to, uh, to, to, to see what is the impact of ANL by calculating the post-Newtonian angular uh, diameter distance for different values of ANL inside this uh, confidence interval. The result is that the variation for post-Newtonian angular diameter distance calculated at different values of ANL is of the order of 10 to the minus nine, which is very small, uh, which is roughly four or the sm uh, smaller than all the other comparison that we uh, considered. So the last point was to uh, ident uh, identify and quantif uh, um, to quantify and isolate uh, the nonlinear post-Newtonian correction. Um, so in the first point, I said that we, um, so we saw that the linear and the post-Newtonian angular diameter distance gives uh, the same corrections over the Newtonian angular diameter distance. Uh, we trace this behavior uh, to the present, uh, the presence in the metric of this term, uh, which is called the initial seed and represent um, the initial conditions of our, uh, uh, of, of the, um, curvature perturbation. So once again, as I said, this term is linear and post-Newtonian. So it is present in the linear and post-Newtonian approximation of the metric, but it is absent in the Newtonian one. So to see what is the impact of having this term in the metric, we defined a new metric, which we called N tilde, which is essentially the Newtonian metric plus the, this initial seed. And then we calculate linear Newtonian, post-Newtonian, and this uh, modified, uh, modified Newtonian metric. Um, sorry, we calculate the angular diameter distance in, in these uh, uh, four approximations for the metric. And we compare them with the angular diameter distance in the homogeneous lambda CDM background. And this is what I'm showing uh, he here in this plot. And I don't, I don't know if you can see uh, that uh, we barely distinguish between the red line, which is the comparison for the post-Newtonian angular diameter distance, from the solid black line, which is the comparison for this modified Newtonian angular diameter distance. 
implying the fact that the biggest part to the post-Newtonian contribution uh, to the angular diameter distance came from the initial seed. The very small difference uh, between these two curves is due to the remaining nonlinear post-Newtonian corrections, which have uh, which are of the order of 10 to the minus six, so much smaller. Okay, so we can summarize the results saying that uh, in agreement uh, with other uh, results in the literature, we found that uh, the impact of uh, uh, nonlinear corrections are, uh, of, of, are much smaller than the 1%, uh, but also we saw that linear uh, Newtonian, post-Newtonian Newtonian have a similar uh, uh, variation. And we trace this behavior back to the, to the fact that the Newtonian approximation of the metric is missing the uh, linear and post-Newtonian initial seed term. Then we also analyzed other sources of nonlinearities, and, and we saw that uh, the, uh, the amplitude of, of our uh, variations uh, decrease monotonically when we take smaller scales. We saw also that the impact of, uh, uh, of the primordial non-Gaussianity is subleading with respect to the variation between linear Newtonian and post-Newtonian order. And also uh, that the, um, the remaining post nonlinear post Newtonian uh, corrections to the angular diameter distance are still bleeding respect to the initial seed, which can be seen as the, uh, as the main contribution to the angular diameter distance coming from the uh, gravitational potential. Okay, so uh, we reached the end of uh, my presentation. I hope I was able to show you that the BGO provides a unified framework uh, for studying light propagation in uh, general relativity. And also that big O light is a valid numerical tool for studying uh, light propagation in uh, numerical relativity, able to reproduce well-known results, but also to perform complex analysis like the one uh, I just presented. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions and discussions. So, I have a question that bothers yeah. me for some time. I don't understand one why four sigma difference is called tension. What does tension mean here if it's just a difference between two predictions? Well, uh, the point is that uh, four sigma of uh, is a tension because uh, uh, we are measuring, we have two big experiments which are measuring the same quantity and with a good precision in, you know, in for those two, uh, uh, within those two, two experiments, but those measurements doesn't match. Then there is a, a third, a third, uh, sorry, there is also other kind of measurements of the same, uh, I need to go, uh, of the same measurements. So he, this plot refers to H naught, to, to the Hubble constant, what is called Hubble constant. And so this is uh, uh, the measurement which came from uh, the analysis of the uh, cosmic micro microwave wave background. And this is instead from, uh, so high redshift, and this is from the supernova. So this is constructed starting from uh, the distance ladder. So we measure distance step by step uh, and we try to uh, infer the values of H naught. And these two quantities doesn't match, even if they are, have, let's say, a relatively good precision. There is other kind of measurements, for instance, with the gravitational waves. It is still too early to have a, a, a definitive answer, but the gravitational waves predicts a different values, which is in between. There so are many that, occasions where two experiments give so, different results and nobody called it tension. There is a difference, for example, in muon magnetic moment, et cetera, in proton radius, and nobody calls it tension. Astrophysicists, cosmologists in particular, have a tendency to invent their own names for something which is obvious. You, you know, uh, astrophysics people and cosmologists 
are weird pe person. They call uh, um, metal, metal, everything else is not uh, hydrogen uh, and uh, helium. So. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? It's hard to, to gauge the predictive power of the method. Uh, so far, I, as I understand, you did not predict anything. Um, yes. So the point is that um, um, this method uh, uh, reproduced uh, everything that was done in the past, in the sense of, uh, uh, for, for, as for regards uh, uh, the lensing effects. Um, the point is that when we want to do cosmology with, uh, I don't know, um, uh, the parallax, so measuring the, uh, the parallax distance, this is very difficult because uh, the, the um, uh, parallax distance um, can be calculated, uh, let's say, in a closer range, like, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in, in, inside the galaxy. For instance, uh, uh, Gaia uh, will measure parallax uh, distance uh, of some uh, objects. Uh, with the high precision. But when we want to do this in cosmology, the distances are much bigger. So uh, people just said, okay, we will never measure this. So we'll, let's start to concentrate on other kind of measurements. Also, I, also I, you know, let, let me say also this, uh, uh, the uh, redshift drift. Redshift drift is uh, very powerful in the sense that it can probe the evolution of the of the of the um, of the space time in a modern independent way so mm -hmm. we can measure the redshift drift uh, and then um, try to infer the the parameters like h naught and so on the point uh, the point is that it is very small it has a variation of 10 to the minus 19 um, 10 to the minus 18 in uh, five years, I, I can remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very small. Let me rephrase it. And of course, I know that it's, it's, it, it would be too good to, to, uh, to be expected. Somehow, uh, the, all the methods that you've described are, are assuming we know the metric and then let's compute the observables. Would be in would be very nice if there would be some kind of the at least a, a little bit of the inverse problem, namely here are the observations. What can we say about the matrix? Yes, and that, that's what people try to do because this is right the the common problem in in numerical uh, relativity. So we give uh, uh, the initial condition to a uh, to a machine which solves Einstein equation, right? So mm -hmm. if we set the initial condition to give lambda CDM, the, 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 the machine will produce lambda CDM, obviously. So what people are trying to do is to give uh, the most general possible initial conditions to generate the most general possible uh, evolution of the, of the metric according to Einstein equation. There are other, po other possibility, modifying the, the equations, the Einstein equations, to see if uh, what is called uh, uh, modified gravity can give some um, uh, predictions or uh, sorry, can uh, describe some, some observations better than the current model. So this is what is, what is done. The code, mm -hmm. obviously the, the package uh, I'm using relies on the space-time uh, evolution on the on the space time simulation and just perform the light propagation with this method okay i understand thank you are there any more questions okay at the moment i don't see any and in that case thank you very much thank you again michaela